There's something about turning 60 that's been so wonderful about letting go of some of the baggage of trying to compete with your younger self, you know, and there was a lot of pressure to compete with my younger self. Jodie, Kaylee, how are you? Great, how We're are good. You? It's episode six I is know. coming out. I know. Very and excited. It's been the most incredible journey, this show, True Detective, Night Country. You guys went in for this, didn't you? How much of a challenge was this? Well, the cold stuff is a challenge, yeah. Yeah. right? It gets well, cold. I mean, we have things on, we have clothes on. Yeah. And we have little wormy things. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. You, you had the warm socks. I did have the warm socks. Warm socks. You said there was warm underwear, but they didn't give me any warm underwear. I didn't underwear. get the warm under okay, underwear. Well, I, I got the either. socks with the little, the remote. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, we had the equipment, but you still have to breathe. Yeah. yeah. And have to talk. And talking mm -hmm. is difficult when it's that cold. Yeah. Especially when you're acting. Yeah. Yeah. There's that. Talking's key. Talking's <laughs> <laughs> key. I just love how you had remote control socks on. Yeah, so no, it was it had a little like I like put it hooked it on some like little belt loop thing. Yeah. Mm. And so anytime I felt like my feet were kinda getting cold, I would just doop doop I'll press a little button. Mm. Stunning tip. Yes, yes. Running to Amazon straight after this yes, to get those. Yes, socks and vest. It was it. it and, really but helped. she actually had the hat, which can look slightly ridiculous, but not on you. No, no. She had, with that had all this fur part to it on the inside. Yeah. And really uh, so you got lucky with that. Yeah, I did, I'm the only character that gets to wear the hat. So yeah. stunning. Yeah. You look great in it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, th what is so special about this show is you two and the amazing teamwork that your characters come to develop and the unlikely friendship that they have as well. How special was it creating the bond between you two, on set, off set, and like how much do you think you've changed as people through working together and what have you learned from each other? Going into this, especially being so new to this and this being such a big monster of a production that was just like, I was like a little kid, like, oh my goodness. I learned a lot of technical stuff from picking yeah. your brain, I'm like, What's MOS? What does that mean? <laughs> but um, the best thing about this whole his whole journey is that like we came in here as as coworkers, but mm. I get to like call all these wonderful women mm. and people my friends. Like you're my homie. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's it a really family cool. thing. Yeah, I mean, we really, especially when you spend that long in seven months, it's yeah. a long time someplace on location that where it is sort of adverse. There's a lot of things to bring you together. It, plus, it's really good and. You know, I don't know. I think that has its special, special touch when you know that you're making something that's meaningful, that, yeah. that touches you and that, you know, feels so important. What did you think you learned from working with Kaylee? Well, everything. Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, Kaylee's very disciplined. So she's, she's well, you're an athlete. So mm -hmm. she can do something a hundred times and she has the focus to keep doing it. And um, she can do everything well, which is actually kind of annoying. <laughs> That is annoying when you meet someone like that. Yeah, it's a little annoying. <laughs> like we, we, I, when we were in Alaska together, because we, we went to Alaska together, um, they were like, oh, here, this is chopping wood. Kaylee, you try it. She was just like, boom, boom, <laughs> boom. Like 400 pieces of logs went in half. I couldn't get one, not one. And fishing, she pulls up like a million fly fish. Fly fishing, I never did fly. I'm like, yeah, never did it. it. And she gets like 15 fish or something. And right. I got like one. Watch me. Yep. Um, Watch me work. Hold my beer. <laughs> so she, I mean, there's nothing to, you know, she's a natural. So that, I guess it reconfirms the idea that instincts are everything. Mm. They're the most important thing that we have. And if you are, if you can look into the eyes of your coworker, your partner without fear, like that, you have everything you need. And then you can just relax and drink coffee. Yeah. That's, right. yeah. that's what's so special about teamwork, right? Yeah, and I, did, I didn't do a lot of movies in my career where I was a team. I was, it was always my singular journey. And I was always like, my dad's dead. My husband's dead. My child is dead. You know, everybody's always dead so that I'm I can be. On the plane. <laughs> yes, on, on the plane. Is she dead? Is she not dead? But I, I really missed out on something that I got to have now in my late, when my late 50s happened and in my 60s, where I suddenly got to understand that there was a new thing for me to do, which is to serve other people and to really mm -hmm. um, to be there for people when it's their time and it's her time. And it's, yeah. for me, it is so much more satisfying and so much more fun to be like the cheerleader team person enjoying something amongst people and supporting somebody who's, who is the central journey of the film. These two characters are in this very male-dominated world, and they come up against discrimination left, right, and center all the time. What kind of everyday discrimination have you guys come up against where sometimes you're like, I cannot believe that I'm still having to deal with this in 2024? 
Oh, my everyday walking life is yeah. an everyday discrimination. Um, I can speak on something mm -hmm. that's relatable to my character being of, she's from a Nupiak and Dominican background. I'm from Cape Verdean and Wampanoag, where I had a very simplest explanation, uh, black native or Afro-Indigenous, mm -hmm. where you don't feel like you're enough for native people. And especially mm -hmm. in North America, there's this one dimensional view of how a Native American or Indian mm -hmm. is supposed to look like. You're supposed to look like this, like you're from the Midwest, and if you look anything different, then, well, you sure you don't look native. I'm like, mm -hmm. I actually look exactly like my ancestors from yeah. my people that I came from. I, I didn't come from like Oklahoma or anything, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't look like anybody. And the you don't look native thing is like really, it's um it's an opportunity. I look at it as an opportunity mm -hmm. for education now though. Um, I Sometimes it's an eye roll, but it's an eye roll, like I have to explain myself, but it's an opportunity, so um, yeah. Do you also use it as fuel to fuel you to prove people wrong? Uh, yeah, since I came out in 86, I've been trying to prove people wrong and myself right when I was believing what everybody else said. So I was almost trying to like, oh yeah, you know, I am this, I am that because that's what they said I was. But now I'm like proving everybody wrong. No, I'm gonna do this and this is not who I am. And I'm actually proud of, of who I am and then being, a woman in a male-dominated sport in a profession. Yeah. Um, you know, also coming from an area, again, back to indigenous roots where people just think, because I'm native, I grew up on a reservation. I did not. I did not grow <laughs> up on a reservation. Uh, there's there's Native Americans that actually, in 2024, that we don't live like we did in the 1500s. So I am a walking, talking human being that mm -hmm. understands everything that's going on. I'm very, <laughs> I retain it all, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And Jenny, for you, you've gone through your whole career since the age of three in a male-dominated world, right? Yeah, yeah. So leaning into that experience you've had and going to play a role where, again, she's in a very male-dominated yeah. world, did you use some of the experiences you had to fuel you? I don't know. You way? know, it's complicated. It's true. I grew up in uh, when there were no women technicians. There were no women in the film industry. I never saw a woman director. Or, or the, I, sometimes I would see a makeup artist, but that was about it. Um, but I also learned from my fathers and brothers, you know, in the industry that taught me, that wanted me to be their, their prodigal daughter, and they wanted to tell me about lenses and, you know, about camera equipment. And um, so I, I, it's a twofold, I have a twofold feeling about that because I'm so grateful for all the men that raised me mm -hmm. in, the, in the industry. Uh, but of course, there's all those microaggressions that people don't even realize are a part of our culture, and we experience them a lot. Uh, you know, for me, it's about leadership styles. And I think sometimes women do have a different leadership style, right? And sometimes in a male dominated world, they don't really understand what that is. It's mm. like, wait a minute. Uh, if I say something mean to you, you're going to cry, right? And you're like, no, not going to cry. <laughs> or how, yeah. why aren't you doing what I'm telling you to do? You know, there's a, uh, it's, it's hard for um, a, a society that's been all male to understand and be able to include different styles of leadership. You know, True Detectives, Night Country, this is such a representative show in a way that we haven't necessarily always seen on TV, right? Indigenous people, you have women front and center in their late 50s, taking control of the narrative, which is what we love to see. How powerful does it feel to feel truly seen and reflected? It's, especially speaking from an indigenous woman, to be able to feel seen, feel heard, and also, I know the millions of other people that like me, indigenous people that look like me, the kids that look like me, or I just come from that type of background can just really feel seen. That's where it's it's satisfying. it's so satisfying. It honestly is. It's a proud moment. And then to you see these women in this male-dominated profession, but they're not crying women this typical stereotypical woman type of role they they very they have to show up in their masculine energy to do this job mm -hmm. they have to work together but they also have to be compassionate and knowing to say okay let me look at this through a little bit more softer lens so mm -hmm. i think that's something that we explored with this show that i'm really proud of too that you didn't really get mm -hmm. to you don't get to see it's like one dimensional like all right she's a woman mm -hmm. cop she has to be this butchy okay. like tough guy yeah. and just like you know but you don't see that you just see real people like real women mm -hmm. doing a real job in the real life so yeah, I feel, I feel I do feel seen with this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This year's been a good year for me. I think uh, there's something about turning sixty that's uh, been so wonderful about letting go of some of the baggage of trying to compete with your older self, younger self. You know, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of pressure to compete with my younger self. And I'm so glad that I can be a character actor um, and that I can bring whatever wisdom and experience that I have 
to the process to help other people, usually it's just about telling them to relax and that they don't have to worry and that they're not in control of it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and that is satisfying to see that I guess I have that skill, that I guess I know how to relax, and then that I can translate that to other people. I can give that to other people. And I make everybody laugh. So. Oh, yeah. You know how to take a nap and you can make some yeah, fun jokes. Yeah, I do know how to take a nap. <laughs> Well, it's so special what you both just said there. It feels like you're in this new space in both your lives at the same time where you're feeling freer. Mm -hmm. Would yeah, you say absolutely. that's true? Absolutely, 100% true for me. Completely, about you? yes, completely. Yeah. Like, just like, I know what you mean about the just not really caring in the most liberating way, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you learn that I think that all that anxiety didn't serve you, that it was mm. just like this, it was keeping you down. Um, and I think, I mean, you've learned, you're, you have to learn that in the ring. Yes. Right? Because yes. the more you worry about it, that's not going to help you get punched in the face. Nope. You're going to just cloud it. clouds your judgment on yeah. what to do, what steps to take, and even out of the ring. Just you can't, you can't drive angry, but you can't mm -hmm. do anything ang angry or you just have to have a clear grounded. You have to be mm -hmm. grounded, whatever it is. You can be grounded in anger, but at least you're clear about it. Yeah. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Just stay grounded. That's good. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you both achieved so much in your respective careers up to this moment as well. And your game changes in your own right. But we see all the success that maybe is on the screen. Oh, this is your third role. You're a champion boxer. And then behind the scenes, there's so much success and failure that goes along the way, right? Yeah. I'll yeah. Say. I'll say. What do you think you've learned about the true value of success? Me personally, is that um, I deserve it. Like, this is like a yes. personal journey. Like, I deserve it. And am I... If my success offends anybody, then it's really not my problem. Um, and I say that with all the love in the world, but like I actually deserve success. Everybody does deserve mm. success and whatever that looks like in their personal journey. But that's the biggest thing I've learned that I deserve it. Mm. Yeah. I think because I had success so young, I mean, I started when I was three and I was already, you know, I was on a show when I was six and I was gotten nominated for an Oscar when I was 12. And I think that I've never felt like, I always felt like it was a fluke. Like I was really lucky and that I was just in the right place at the right time. And I never felt like I had, um, I always felt like I, I should feel bad that I have had all these good things. And um, I, I think that was very liberating what you just said, because I struggle with that a lot, especially now because, uh, you know, it's normal. We think, oh, unless you're having a lot of pain and anxiety, you must not be working hard. Mm. Um, and you associate that, you know, pain, anxiety, you associate that with hard work. and. Um, on this film, I don't think I've ever been as happy. And it was really easy. It was an easy experience. And there was a part of me that was like, oh, it's easy. I must not be working hard. <laughs> but um, I think there's a value to all those years of mm. experience and, and of failing and of um, problems you gave yourself. And in a way, this is sort of the fruit of all that. And on the flip side of that, there comes the failures, right? The knockouts, the knockdowns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have to pick yourself back up She's again. Yeah. <laughs> Never you have knocked out. You've knocked out, but you haven't been knocked out. Yes, right. Which is what we love. Yes. When you, though, are on the floor and you're like, oh my God, how do I pick myself back up? How have you both managed to do that and just keep going? Just the work. To me, that's always, that's always where I go to is I just always go to work. And maybe that's bad. Maybe it means like, I don't know who I am without the work or something. But um, to me, it's always just been my panacea. Like it's been my thing I go to whenever I feel I don't know who I am or something. It's like, I just go back to work. Yeah. But yeah. I think that that means that you do know yourself because you know what you need to feel yeah, like yourself true. again. That's true. Yeah. That's uh, so true. Failure to me is like, it's always, well, like I can't, if I hit the ground, like unless I get a shovel and dig myself a hole to put myself in, this can't get any worse. Where <laughs> where do we yeah, go from yeah. here? And I, I just have a no quit. It's in my genes. I have a no quit. It's like, all right, how can I figure this out? Um, I have to find, I have to always find a way. It may be to the next problem. It may to be to a worse situation, but I got to just put one foot in front of the other. And it's like, dust myself off. What can I learn from this situation? What went wrong? What went, What was okay about this? All right, how can I make this better? And because I've been in some deep, deep holes that I've literally dug myself in or I've gotten thrown in and have to see myself out. But it's just always, everything is temporary. Every right. single thing is temporary. Happiness, sadness, and you can't have one without the other. So like you have a peak and then you kind of go down to the next valley and then you go back up. You have to have that constant so I just always tell them, this is temporary. I know this sucks right now. This is temporary, but it's gonna it's gonna change. I don't know what the change looks like, but this is gonna change. So let me learn what's right in front of me and just kind of like embrace it. And then it's gonna change somehow. I don't know how, the how is not my business. It's just right. 
putting one front in front of the other and knowing and accepting this is temporary, this is temporary, this, my situation will change. There's so many times we have downs, don't we, in our careers where you're like, oh my God, how am I gonna get myself back up again? You have to remind yourself it's temporary. Mm -hmm. But is there maybe a moment in your careers where it's probably felt like a negative period, but you look back on it now and you think that ultimately, that really empowered me into the person I am sitting here today and putting in these incredible performances. Oh yeah. For me, it's my 50s. I mean, the 50s were really hard for me. And I think for a lot of women, because you're like, wait, I can't do what I used to do. I can't, I'm not gonna look the same on that cover or I'm not gonna, I can't compete with my younger self. Um, and if I try to, I just keep failing. Um, but then the world is confusing and you're confused about what it is to be 50 and, and all the images you see are confusing. So for me, that was just like a, that was, and I, I was also incredibly happy in my personal life, but I was, I felt like, I just kept saying like, I was meant to do something meaningful and, I'm, and I can't figure out what it is. And then I don't know what happened. Some 60 happened, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Then True Detective came along. Yeah. That's right. Bam. <laughs> yes, there, there you go. There you go. It's been the biggest pleasure talking to you guys oh, you today. Do. But before we go, we uh -huh. always end on one final question. Okay. And that is, in the reign of your life, what's the one rule you'll always live by? I like more milk, no moo. <laughs> You're gonna have to break that one down. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> More milk, less moo. No moo. It's like basically just like, just give us the product and make the thing and stop complaining. Okay. Oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah. I'm like, stop. so like, are you like some tarant? Do you want like almond milk? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. like, it's like you're giving More up milk, with oat less milk. milk. That's what it's More yeah. milk, less moo. Okay. Yeah, that's what I like. Oh, you got one? You got a motto? Um, do your best to lead in love, whatever your different decisions are. I'd really, especially in the last couple of years, like whatever it is, just try to lead it with love, whether it's to let something go, or to choose to do something, not to do something, do your best. <laughs>